Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and you're watching The Brown Feminist. Now in today's video, I want to answer a question that I have been asked by many of you and that is, what exactly is a CRO? That word keeps coming up again and again when you are searching for jobs in clinical research and the job descriptions, organization descriptions, different videos. And it's true, there is actually a lot of this like um, jargon that is in any kind of industry, especially in clinical research, where people just throw out words like CRO and ECDs and REVs and we don't always know what we're talking about or what we're hearing because we are new to the industry and we just haven't had an exposure to that term. So don't worry, I've been right where you are and I completely get it. So in today's video, I'm going to be telling you what exactly a CRO or a contract research organization is in the context of clinical research. Without further ado, let's get into it. Now, as you know, whenever we're kind of discovering new drugs or new kind of systems of doing treatments on patients with various diseases, a lot of that research happens from the pharmaceutical industries. Now, lots of pharmaceutical industries have all of these kind of laboratories where they kind of cook up different kinds of experimental drugs or investigational drugs where we don't really know if it works in humans, but they've done some work maybe within the lab, within tissue culture, they've done some animal models, they've published. So there is a lot of hope that it's going to work. At least it's worked maybe in the animal models, but now it's time to test the drug and bring it to the market. Now this is huge as an industry and it takes a lot of time to do it and kind of, it's a really good example of where the bench kind of comes to the bedside. So we're discovering things in the wet lab on the bench work that the scientists are doing, but it eventually needs to come into the clinical world. And that is when you and I as clinical researchers have a huge role to play. So what usually happens is there are multi-phase clinical trials, phase one, two, three, four. Typically phase one is done on humans who are healthy volunteers. And the goal is not to treat the disease, but just to see when you apply this drug to kind of a human body among people who are otherwise healthy, but kind of in the same physiology or age group or ethnicity or whatever, similar to the target population, then does it have side effects? Are there kind of toxicities? Or is there liver shutting down? Is there kidney shutting down? then if you have promising results in phase one where you're seeing not a lot of adverse effects and you know you it's kind of going the way you're expecting you kind of proceed to phase two trials which is done in a small number of patients who actually have the condition that this drug is trying to treat now within this group often you might have placebo control trials single blind double blind trials and things like that we'll go into those definitions another day but for now, let's just understand that it goes through multiple phases of trials in a small population, large population, and the eventual goal is to bring this drug to the market so it can be accepted as a treatment for certain diseases. And then it will be available in pharmacies and doctors will learn about it and will prescribe them to patients. So that's kind of the goal of like a pharma company when they're developing a drug, right? Now, where do we come in? Of course, whenever they have to do testing on humans, it's not really in the scope of a typical pharma company to take that on. Because pharma companies don't necessarily specialize in doing clinical research on human subjects and patients because when you're treating a patient with this drug, you can't just like take a patient who's like really sick, maybe has like, I don't know, kidney failure or cancer or something, and then put them in a pharmaceutical company lab and go like, here's one thing to treat you. These patients might have other medical needs. They might be like in a hospital bed. They might be like paralyzed and so many other things, many different medical needs and comorbidities. So the pharma companies are usually more focused on developing the drug, doing the back end R and D, and then eventually focusing on the marketing, the manufacturing of the drug in large doses and kind of like other decisions, right? So this part, they usually outsource it. And who will they give it to? That's where we come in. They give it to CROs, which are contract research organizations, which means these are organizations or institutions who are willing to take on that responsibility. So they will take on a pharma sponsored trial where the pharmaceutical company is kind of providing the study protocol, 
they're designing the study, they're giving you the money to conduct the study, they'll tell you what needs to be reported, what kind of you know things they're expecting to improve or not improve, how to kind of monitor for side effects, and all of that will come from them. But you are kind of in a position to run the study because you specialize in something to do with human healthcare. You maybe you're a physician, maybe you're in a hospital, maybe you're a research organization. So you have a niche expertise. So therefore, the pharma company is coming to you and outsourcing that clinical, like that phase of that clinical trial. So what is a CRO? A CRO can be various different kinds of organizations. There can be clinics which are recognized as CROs because they have kind of fulfilled all the requirement. There can be hospitals that are CROs. There can be various other kind of like medical leaning like community centers, um, community care clinics and things like that which can act as a CRO. Hospital research institutes can act as CROs. So right now I am working for a hospital and the hospital has its own research institute. And within that research institute, there are certain physician scientists and clinician scientists who have accepted a contract with pharmaceutical companies and we are therefore acting as a CRO. And in order to be a CRO, they really prefer, and it's also kind of the law, that you have certain things in place. For example, if they're gonna send you over medication from this pharmaceutical company, you need to have a pharmacist on site to store it to prepare the medication, to check the dosage, to deliver it in a timely manner, to know how, you know, is this medical uh, medication like stable? What's the root of medication? Is it oral? Is it through IV? Is it on the skin? Is it topical? Like what is it? How does it go in and all of that? The place that acts as a CRO, if it's especially like a kind of interventional drug, which is like high risk or going into your body, should have healthcare people, nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, all of them to kind of be able to handle any side effects that are happening, right? So you need to have a full on setup. What if your patient starts coding? What if your patient has an anaphylactic reaction? So you need to have kind of the medical setting. You also need to have like a research ethics board in your institution who will make sure that these are ethically aligned and you know, they will advocate for the rights of the patient, um, the human subjects who are recruited into the trial and all of that. So there's a lot of different requirements. And if you want, if you meet all these requirements, you can partner with pharma. In that case, what happens is one person, who's usually the PI, the principal investigator, is kind of the lead person at that site. So a CRO, which is the research organization, from the perspective of a pharmaceutical company is considered one site. Now, a drug usually doesn't function only through one site. For example, if you're discovering a new drug, you obviously want to see, is it working in patients in Canada? Is it working in patients in the US? Is it working in patients in India? Is it working in patients in China? You don't just want to do like, yeah, in that one city, in that one population, maybe just on Caucasians, this drug has worked, therefore I'm going to bring it to market. No, they want to have a variety of sites. They want to pull in the data and show like ethnic and other homogeneity um, of data across various regions and things like that, right? They want to make sure no matter where the study was conducted, we pulled the data in and it still showed low side effect and high efficacy that it's working. That will help them move forward to the next phase of the trial. So that's where we come in as the CRO. Now at the CRO, like I was saying, usually like a physician or a clinician scientist acts as the principal investigator. There can be other like junior physicians or scientists who will act as the sub investigators. Then there is clinical research staff. Now, depending on how elaborate the clinical trial is at that site or how many clinical trials with different pharma companies are being run at the site, there might be one, two, five, ten, or more clinical staff. Now, you might have a clinical research manager, clinical trial coordinator, research associate, like lots of different roles down to like clinical research assistants. And that's basically how a CRO works. So it is a CRO and the PI's responsibility to make sure the medical, clinical, ethical obligations, as well as any kind of regulatory obligations towards Health Canada or FDA are being met. They are being informed of anything that's going wrong in the study, but they also have to keep informing the pharma company. Because end of the day, the pharma company are outsourcing this to you and they need to know if anything has messed up or anything has gone wrong or anything didn't turn out the way that they had hoped it would or they had expected it would, so that they can also go back to their like, the lab and maybe modify things for the next stage. 
So you have a big responsibility as a CRO. You're letting the monitors know that guess what? Hey, you're a representative of the pharma company. This is what's going on. You're telling us to do this, but it's not working. You're letting your research ethics board know. Hey, guess what? We were supposed to do this ethically, but this is why this thing had to change because the circumstances were like this. You have to tell your regulators, okay, this drug, which is a regulated study where we're doing a phase two trial or phase three trial or something else for a, a drug trial, drug intervention. This was supposed to happen, but the patient had like a severe anaphylactic reaction or a severe side effect. The patient's in a coma, God forbid. But something that has happened and we need to do like an important information to our regulatory authorities. You will also be obviously reporting to your patient. You will also be interacting with your patient's immediate care team, your patient's like attending, your patient's physician, your patient's specialist, your patient's nurses who are giving them like the usual care as well as you are bringing to them an experimental care. Maybe the usual care for certain cancers and you know, maybe there's not a lot of hope so maybe they're just doing like the routine symptomatic management and pain management and other like feeding and physio. But then you are going in with like this one interventional drug, which is like an add on to their normal routine of care. This is typically how a CRO functions. Now, not every CRO has to be a hospital. If it is, there's certain benefits to it for sure, because you have the capacity to screen from your inpatient population. But you can have CROs who kind of recruit from the population in the region and they have patients who are more mobile and less sick come in for their treatments and then leave and then come in for their follow-ups and then leave. So a variety of kind of organizations can work as CROs. So when you hear the term CRO, the main thing I want you to kind of take away from this video and understand is CRO kind of explains the dynamics of the team you will be working at because the study that has been designed, the drug that has been designed, the protocol that has been designed did not come out of the minds or decisions of your PI. Your PI is kind of like working off of what the pharma company has given them. And of course they have a huge responsibility legally and ethically to make sure it's being implemented correctly. And they're helping in like selecting the patients and screening them and kind of recommending you like, hey, you're my trial coordinator. I think this patient would be a good candidate and so on. Maybe your PI is kind of helping administer the drug or administer the surgical method or whatever it is. But in different cases, when you are not in a CRO, there are physicians who themselves take on certain physician-led studies, right? In that case, it is the physician who is deciding what protocol will be implemented, who will be like, um, what will happen to people in the interventional group versus the control group. How is he going to monitor them? He might also be blinded from knowing which patient got what. Maybe you are the one in charge of delivering it. Whatever it is, in that case, there is no pharmaceutical company in the picture in a physician-led study. But whenever it's called a CRO, the investigator themselves has obligation to inform the pharma company, blah, blah, blah. The funding also comes from the pharma company. Whereas in a physician-led study, the funding is something the physician has to figure out. Physician or clinician investigator might need to apply for grants. They might need to get internal money from the hospital. They might need to find like various kinds of research funding to be able to conduct this. Whereas in a CRO, your funding and every kind of involved costs are coming in from the pharmaceutical company because it's a for-profit business that's outsourcing this part of the study to your CRO. So these are like really very different, very different environments. I have so far worked in both kind of environments and they're interesting in different ways. In a CRO, you don't have to constantly worry about, okay, like grant is gonna expire and where's the funding coming from, blah, blah, blah. But you also don't have a lot of leeway when designing the protocol because the protocol is handed to you. So in terms of the research, while I now get to do a lot of the regulatory stuff and I do a lot of the um, like making sure the ethics is right, the regulatory is right, the documentation, the clinical coordination, the assessments, the follow-ups, but I don't really get to do anything when it comes to the research data, data analytics, publications, that part is not happening because all the data is gonna belong to this pharmaceutical company. Whereas when I've worked with physician-led studies or nurse-led studies or clinical epidemiologist-led studies, I was both conducting the assessments, which are a lot less interventional, but I was kind of also in charge of some of the data management, some of the analysis, preparing manuscripts, preparing grant submissions. So there was a lot more of that. 
So depending, are you here for the academic kind of intellectual thrill of doing like your own research and kind of presenting your data, kind of getting published? Then I would recommend that you go more towards like academic leaning or physician led projects. Um, but if you really want to do like more management level, trial coordination level work where you're handling like um, how to deal with different stakeholders in pharma and regulatory bodies and REBs and patients and different physicians and different projects, that management experience, I feel that really comes better by working for a CRO. So that's it for this video. I hope I've been able to explain a little bit about what a CRO is and how it really functions or affects us as people who are working in the world of clinical research. As always, don't forget to give me your comments, feedback, ideas, thoughts, opinions in the comment section down below. And if you like the content in my channel, please do subscribe and help me grow and hit the subscribe button right there. Until next time, this was The Brown Feminist. Bye.